Good morning. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, to the virtual folks and to thank you, the in in person folks. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we're gathered in the traditional and ancestral um, and unceded territory of the Coast Salish uh, peoples, the Squamish, Salish, and the Musqueam. We're grateful for their stewardship in these lands. We're fortunate today to have Dr. Janice Leung present. You can see the topic, uh, Cannabis in the Lung. Janice is a respirologist here. She works in HIV. She has a Tier 2 Canada Research Chair in Translational Airway Biology. Um, so I'm looking forward to the talk, Janice. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much uh, for the introduction, Barry, um, and thanks for the opportunity to speak today. Um, I'm going to be talking about our work on uh, cannabis smoking and the lung, and uh, my goals for this talk are, first of all, to review some of the history and the epidemiology of cannabis smoking in Canada, particularly since legalization in 2018. I'm going to review the literature on the impact of cannabis smoking on the lung, and then the last part of my talk, I want to talk about our local cohort here um, that we set up to study cannabis smoking. It's called the Canuck Study. And um, I'll be presenting some uh, preliminary findings um, from that study. Um, what I'm not going to talk about, cannabis is obviously a very very big topic. I'm not going to be necessarily touching upon the uh, psychological aspects, addiction, uh, use disorders, um, some of the many other uh, impacts that uh, cannabis can have on the human body. I'm also, for the interest of time, only going to be speaking about smoking in particular. There is a whole other body of literature on vape, but I won't um, touch upon that just because of time. Um, the other thing that I'll mention before I start is uh, a little bit about terminology. Um, my preferred term here is cannabis, which is the, the taxonomic classification um, of the plant. Uh, there are obviously a number of other names for cannabis in the scientific literature. I'm going to try as best I can to avoid the term marijuana, which does have its roots in, in, in more of a, a racialized conversation uh, about cannabis. It was a term that um, developed in the 1920s as a way to kind of associate um, uh, the anti-drug movement with a racialized other, in particular, um, people of Mexican descent. So I'm going to try to avoid that term. If you see that on my slides, it is because there are papers out there that do use that term. I can't, I couldn't, I didn't feel like I could could edit everybody's uh, figures or 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 uh, quote them differently from what they've stated. But my preferred term for this talk will be will be cannabis. Um, so that is, of course, the uh, the taxonomic classification that was um, developed by Linnaeus back in 1753. Of course, cannabis has been used much longer than that, but uh, he classified it first through these documents, which are now housed in the Natural History Museum in London. Um, there are a number of species under that genus, but uh, the ones for human consumption that we often talk about are sativa, indica, and ruderalis. And of course, the reason why they're part of our lexicon is because because one of the constituent chemical components is delta-9 THC, which has those psychotropic uh, effects. Um, now, the various species of cannabis will have varying levels of THC. So, for example, indica will have much higher THC than, for example, sativa. Um, but they work on the human body uh, through many different ways. There's uh, you know, pleiotropic effects on you know, not just mood um, and uh, uh, you know, emotional state, uh, but also appetite, digestion, metabolism, oops, um, uh, immunity, inflammation. And uh, they work through the endocannabinoid system, which is um, made up of CB1 and CB2 receptors in the human body and their ligands, so uh, 2-AG and anandamide. And um, uh, THC is a partial agonist of CB1 and CB2 receptors. And this, uh, because the CB1 is highly concentrated in the peripheral and central nervous system, in you know, the amygdala, hippocampus, repo cortex, that's where you get these psychotropic effects. Now, human use of cannabis dates back to, at least as we know, about 2,700 years ago. So this is uh, a research that has been done in Western China. And this is an archaeologically abundant site because these civilizations dug very deep graves in a very arid climate in very alkaline soil. And so the preservation of these tombs has allowed uh, researchers to study the use of cannabis because these graves have included 
canisters with cannabis in them. And so uh, you can see. <laughs> <laughs> so um, uh, these uh, holders here contained uh, what we think is uh, ancient cannabis. And so you see here the, the, the electron micrographs of what those plants showed, and you can comp compare that to the present day cannabis leaf. Um, there is some evidence to suggest that these civilizations knew about these psychotropic properties because all that was found in these holders were female flowers and, 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 and plant products that would have been, you know, had higher psychotropic capacity. So, so it's thought that they probably knew about these properties back then. Um, if you look at uh, the sort of paleobotanical studies, it's probably been uh, around this area in Asia since at least 12,000 uh, BC, but then it spreads human use from that 2000 BC through to uh, Africa, Europe, and then in the 19th century to the Americas. And then we're pretty latecomers to this in around the 20th century is when you start to see uh, cannabis being used in North America. Now, written documentation of uh, the psychotropic um, uh, abilities of cannabis comes from the ancient Greeks, and in particular Herodotus, who wrote in the histories, the Scythians, as I said, take some of this hemp seed, presumably flowers, and creeping under the felt coverings, throw it upon the red hot stones. Immediately it smokes and gives out such a vapor as no Grecian vapor bath can exceed. The Scythes, delighted, shout for joy ancient Greeks getting a high. Now, we move then towards its use in the medical community because if it has these properties and perhaps it can be used as a medication. And evidence of this comes from ancient China in around uh, the second and third centuries, particularly this, this physician or this surgeon, Hua Tuo. And the, the characters for this in, 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 the, in the Chinese history, um, they refer to this, this compound, uh, which is very similar to what they refer to as cannabis now. So the literal translation of this term is cannabis boiling powder. And it's felt that he likely used this as an anesthetic during surgery. Uh, and here's a stylized rendition of this. This is him performing surgery on a famous warrior. And you can see that, you know, either he is a very good surgeon, this warrior is very brave, or this cannabis boiling power is very effective because he is playing a board game whilst undergoing surgery. This is all speculative, though, because the actual formulation of cannabis boiling powder has been lost, you know, to the embers of history. Um, but we now move then to Western medicine. And so this starts to come into to Western medicine at the end of the, uh, uh, the, the 19th century. Um, this is a treatise written into Lancet um, by J. Russell Reynolds. He is a very prominent physician in the UK who happens to be Queen Victoria's physician. And legend has it that Queen Victoria used cannabis as a way to treat uh, painful menstrual cramps. And so he documents here in this, in this treatise his three-year experience with cannabis. And he feels that this, this medication is highly effective at not just menstrual cramps, but other forms of pain. So migraines, gout, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of any sort of inflammation in the body. And he even recommends it to parents who may have teething babies, that this is actually a very useful method of, uh, of alleviating that their, their symptoms. He also makes some very uh, key observations, which is to say that the potency of the cannabis he was using was highly dependent on who he bought it from. So he recommended that you always should buy from the same guy and you should always make your own tinctures. The other observation that he made was that the an individual's response to cannabis was, was, was very idiosyncratic. Um, and so he recommended that you start low and go slow. Now, despite these very prominent uh, physicians and patients uh, using cannabis, if we move to the 20th century now, it's really actually uh, sort of a, 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 the opposite effect. We're, we're, we're now entering a century in which there is much more of a punitive attitude towards cannabis. And so I'll take you through the legal history of cannabis in Canada, which really have to start off in the early 20th century with various opium acts. And so this is starting to, you know, we're starting to see um, a more punitive attitude towards drugs. And I will say that this is all 
all sort of couched in terms of race here. Okay, so in the early 20th century, opium is associated with China, it's associated with people of Chinese descent. And the actions against drugs are often uh, influenced by that, uh, that racialized other. That comes to a head in around 1922 when this uh, book is published. This is, this is The Black Candle by Emily Murphy. Some of you may have heard of Emily Murphy. She was a woman's rights advocate uh, in the early 20th century. She was actually the first female magistrate in Canada and actually in all of the, uh, the British Empire. But she takes the view, her thesis is that drugs are a threat to white society, in particular to white women. And the mediator of that threat was whom she called the Chinese peddler. And in that book, she has this seven page chapter called Marijuana, A New Menace. And that kind of brings marijuana into the conversation. It's really interesting because she would actually go on to um, be one of the leading voices for eugenics and for sterilization policies in the 1950s and 60s. Um, but interesting, she's highly celebrated. You know, I, I grew up in Edmonton where she did her work and there are parks named after her and, and there are historical monuments. So, so it's kind of interesting, though, to take her whole history as a whole you know, as a whole, perhaps uh, necessitate some revision. Now, uh, one year later, you know, historians will debate whether that, that how much influence that book had, but one year later, cannabis gets added then to the confidential restricted list. And, you know, whether it was a coincidence or not, that also happens to be the year of the Chinese Exclusion Act, which, is, which would uh, bar any sort of legal uh, immigration of Chinese people to Canada until 1947 when it's repealed. Now, all this sort of remains theoretical, though. The actual first seizure of cannabis by Canadian police was not until 1937. Now, we move along to the 1960s, which with the counterculture, there's increasing popularity of cannabis and the backlash against that with increased penalties. We come, however, to this landmark case in 2000 in Ontario. This is Terry Parker, who is a, a patient with epilepsy and who found very severe epilepsy, who found that really the only thing that helped with his seizures was cannabis. And he won his case um, at the Ontario Court of Appeal because as Canadians, we all have the right to life, liberty and security. And the court felt that by denying him cannabis, we were denying him those inalienable rights. And so that leads to the medical marijuana access regulations and ultimately in 2018 to full legalization of cannabis in Canada. Now, um, legalization around the globe remains very, uh, you know, we're one of the few countries really, so all the countries in blue here are countries that have fully legalized cannabis. Um, the vast majority of the world, it remains illegal. And in some areas like the United States, you can see this patchwork of legality where there are certain states where it is legal and other states where it is completely Illegal. It actually remains a federally illegal substance in the United States. So what that means is that, um, you know, uh, even if California decides to pass uh, a law stating it's legal to, uh, to smoke cannabis there, the feds at any point in time could intervene depending on who is sitting in the White House. The other thing it means is that if, you know, you travel from California to Oregon, even though those are two states that are uh, that that have, uh, you know, legal use for cannabis because you're crossing state lines, you've just committed a federal crime. So anything over a highway or an airplane will be uh, under federal jurisdiction. So, so you can see how it becomes very legally complicated. But I think the takeaway from this map is that, you know, as one of the few countries where full legalization um, has been realized, we do have this unique opportunity to study cannabis without sort of the repercussions uh, from the criminal justice system. So what has that meant for cannabis use? So you can see here, this is a survey that Statistics Canada puts out every year where um, uh, it, it asks about 10,000 Canadians about their use of cannabis. And there's a sizable portion of our population that are currently using cannabis. So in British Columbia, 31% have used cannabis in the past 12 months. Nationally, it's about 27%. But if you think about it, compare that to how many people are smoking cigarettes, which is about 10% of the population. Um, the numbers vary, so it'll be as high as 41% in the Northern Territories, but as low as 18% um, in Quebec. 
There has been some debate as to what the pandemic has done towards use. Um, in general, I think it's probably leveled out. So um, on this survey, they asked um, participants whether or not they increased or decreased their use of cannabis during the pandemic. Half said it stayed the same, a quarter said it went up, and a quarter said it went down. Now, there are other uh, countries where a more systematic approach has been done to actually ask that question, which is to say that they are looking at their waste water. And in certain countries like Spain and Portugal, there was no rise during the pandemic. But on the other hand, in countries like Iceland, there was this increase. So hard to say at this point in time. Since legalization, you could say here that there has been this general rise, um, a slight rise, but over the last couple of years, probably it has stayed uh, relatively level. In terms of how often participants are using cannabis, um, there is, uh, you know, I would say 20% uh, of uh, patients who are really using it on a daily basis. And then it will range all the way to a third of patients who are using it for less than a day a month. Um, um, but there, there is a, you know, a sizable portion who are using it quite considerably. The other thing to note from this survey is that it really is a uh, youth, uh, a youth, um, uh, youth dominated um, usage here. So you see here that you know up to fifty percent of twenty to twenty four year olds have used cannabis in the last month. Um, compare that to you know over. Uh, 25 years and older, we're only 20%. Um, so, you know, when we're thinking about early life risk and sort of the, the progression of lung disease over time, um, this is something to keep in mind. Also, the other thing that I, I note from this slide is that it can be difficult to compare cannabis users to, say, tobacco users who may be a lot older in the population. Smoking by and far is the most predominant method of using cannabis, but there are a number of other modes of ingestion, including eating, vaping, dabbing. Um, smoking is a very effective way at using cannabis. It, um, the onset is very quick, so you'll have an effect within three to 10 minutes. It doesn't last too long, so you're not high for, too, you know, for extended periods of time. And uh, a larger portion of it is systemically bioavailable, so up to 25 to 30% compared to ingestion where only about, you know, say five to 10% is systemically bioavailable. Um, I'll, I'll show you data later that suggests that, um, you know, at least in our cohort, a lot of patients use multiple methods uh, of cannabis. So it makes it difficult to really isolate a signal uh, of lung injury for smoking. Now, whether or not people perceive that there is a risk from cannabis smoking, these are pre-legalization data, and um, it's kind of mixed. So 21% were unsure if smoking cannabis caused them any physical harm, and 41% thought that it was probably going to be more harmful than helpful to their overall health um, if they smoked cannabis. In general, it's felt that cigarettes are going to be more harmful than cannabis. Um, but there is some, um, you know, there's still some people who, who, who uh, think that, um, in, in fact, uh, uh, cannabis is more harmful uh, than cigarette smoking. What's interesting is that although um, the prevalence of smoking has gone up since legalization, also the perceived risk has gone up. So even amongst people who are using cannabis, there may be some increase in worry um, over the last few years that cannabis might not be good for their health. Um, and so what are those potential respiratory complications? There are, um, uh, you know, you could, you could develop respiratory infections from your smoking, um, airflow obstruction, whether that be COPD or asthma. There's always been a concern about lung cancer, uh, similar to cigarette smoking. There are, are these case reports in pneumothorax and pneumomediastinum. Um, there is a certain method that cannabis smokers use with deep inhalations and prolonged breath holds uh, that make them at risk for this. Uh, for bullae, in addition, hypersensitivity reactions we have often seen with uh, any sort of smoking, in addition to eosinophilic pneumonia. Um, studying all of these complications in a way that is systematic, that accounts for all uh, confounders, of which there are many, um, is very difficult. Um, and the challenges historically have been, of course, these, these legal restrictions. So, uh, you know, pre-legalization, 31% of cannabis users reported that they um, would be more willing to publicly disclose whether they used cannabis if it was legal. Um, so, you know, if someone 
randomly did a phone survey on you and asked whether you were using cannabis, you might not really want to tell them if you still have all of these legal restrictions. And so while these have been removed in Canada, they clearly uh, remain around the world. The other problem has been that it has been largely confounded by tobacco smoking. So um, there's still about, um, you know, just under 40% who will use tobacco in connection with uh, uh, cannabis. And so trying to, 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 um, uh, to really dive down into the uh, cannabis smoking specific injury signature is quite difficult when you have tobacco mixed in. Yeah, yeah, you can just do it together, right? So, so it can be very difficult to tease out these signals, uh, and I'd say we, you know, we still have difficulty um, when we talk about lung injury. We we really want to to, to phenotype well our cohorts, and uh, you know, with PFTs, CTs, etc. And that has resulted in us repurposing a lot of smoking and COPD cohorts to study cannabis and its injury. And, and whether that's appropriate, whether that reflects the general population, um, it may not capture these, uh, uh, these younger folks who are smoking cannabis. So there's always been a problem with that. And then in addition to that, there's, there's poor standardization of, of its quantification. With any sort of proof of injury, you want to see this dose response. But what exactly this dose is, is much less standardized than, say, cigarette smoking, where we can, say, pack years. Um, we tend to use joint years in, in the cannabis literature, which is a joint per day for how many years. Um, but not everybody will quantify that. Some use grams, some use joints. And so it can be very difficult um, to actually quantify and compare. Uh, to, to, to delineate a, 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 a dose response. Now, in comparison to cigarette smoking, there are some um, differences. So like I mentioned, there is this, this deeper inhalation and um, they will do this breath hold. And so they will actually be um, uh, smoke. You have this inhalation that is about four times longer than what your standard cigarette smoker will do. Because the, the cannabis is also more loosely packed in a joint, for instance, there's less rod filtration. And so you will see actually up to three times more tar deposition into the lung compared to cigarette smoking. And so there are these differences um, that may potentiate whatever injury there is. Now, what happens when you actually smoke a cannabis um, uh, cigarette? This is really old data. I had to really dig into the archives here, but this is Donald Tashkin's uh, 1973 New England paper, uh, which is off-cited. And, and what he did here was he took 32 males um, and he trained them all to smoke in the same way, which is to say that you know they had to, to take these deep inhalations for a certain amount of period of time and then do a breath hold for a certain amount of period of time. So they were all smoking the same way. Um, it's kind of interesting how they used to do research because these are actually males that they would hospitalize for like six weeks and they just stay on an inpatient ward doing all these experiments. But um, what he found was when you subject them to 1% and 2% uh, cannabis, you see this acute bronchodilatory effect. So this is actually airway conductance here on the y-axis. It happens quickly. So you can reach a peak effect by 15 minutes and it's sustained. So you can still have that bronchodilation effect by one hour. And it's higher, significantly higher than say a placebo cigarette. What's interesting is how this compares to a, uh, a non-selective beta agonist. So this is isoproteranol here. So it's, it has a higher bronchodilation effect. It's not mm. the maneuver itself. So if you do the maneuver here without actual um, uh, cannabis being smoked, you won't get that bronchodilation effect. And it's different from tobacco smoking where you see that the airway conductance actually goes down. So in fact, there is this acute bronchodilation effect. Uh, with cannabis smoking. The mechanism for this was worked out um, about 10 years ago when these researchers took bronchial tissue and put them in a, in a dish, did an electric stimulation, and with increasing concentrations of THC, what they found was that there is an inhibition of your cholinergic contraction. So, we're, uh, so you're inhibiting the release of acetylcholine. And you can see here that the tension on, on, on these uh, bronchial smooth muscle cells is a lot lower in those cells treated with THC. So it's kind of like you know nature's spiriva. But before you tell your patients to swap out their spireva for a joint, let's talk about the chronic effects. So, so 
here we see all of the studies that have looked at the impact of cannabis smoking on lung function over time. And you can see here the difficulty, right? We have different age groups. We have different methods of quantifying cannabis use. It's kind of all over the place, different reporting mechanisms. In general, though, what this slide tells us is that there's either no effect on your FEV1 to FEC or there is a decline. But if there is a decline, it's not in your traditional tobacco mechanism where the FEV1 decreases, but actually where your FEC increases, potentially because of that breath hold maneuver and those larger inhalations. An example of this is the Dunedin study. So this is the more recent one. This was published in the Blue Journal last year where you can, this is a, you know, this is a population-based cohort taking, you know, uh, participants from birth to the age of 45. Cannabis here is under uh, the, on the left side, tobacco here on the right side. So what you'll see here is that both, so the unit here is either joint year or pack year. So there is this reduction in their FEV1 to FEC, similar to tobacco, but it's not because their FEV1 is falling like in tobacco, but rather that the FEC increases. And so this is a graphical representation of this. Here's your FEV1 to FEC ratio on the right-hand side. Uh, you can see that cannabis smoking here in the black is associated with a lower uh, FEV1 to FEC ratio compared to non-cannabis smokers. We're divided here between non-tobacco and tobacco, but it's really because the FEC has, you know, either stayed constant or actually gone up. So it's not the same as you would, you know, it's not the same injury as you would expect of a long-time tobacco smoker. Now, the criticism of this is like, you know, birth to 45, that's a pretty young cohort. What if you looked at an older cohort? And I do want to mention here results from the CanCold study because this is uh, a Canadian study. We are one of the sites. Um, Juan Tan led this, um, uh, this study. Don, you're part of it as well. And so this is a, um, a population-based cohort in Canada where, uh, you know, lung function has been collected over time. And the threshold here for injury were, were those who had smoked for greater than 20 joint years. And so their risk of having COPD, not, not COPD in incidents, but prevalence of COPD was about 2.45 times compared um, to non-smokers. Um, and when you look at the decline in FEV1 over time, um, it's that threshold uh, maintained. So those who smoke greater than 20 joint years have a much uh, faster lung function decline compared to the others. Now, there's no significant difference between all these four lines here, which are the lower or ne never smoking groups, but it's really that um, uh, greater than 20 joint years that has that precipitous decline in their FEV1. And what's interesting is that even if you stopped smoking, you didn't really attenuate that decline. So it was still significantly different from never smokers, even if you were a former smoker. So in this older cohort, the average age was 59. Perhaps there is a signal here for COPD. On the other hand, if you look at other measures of COPD like emphysema, um, in fact, this is this is repurposing the spiromics cohort, which is a COPD and smoking cohort. So um, it's interesting that when you quantify emphysema uh, on their CT scans, in fact, those who were currently smoking cannabis actually had less emphysema, significantly less emphysema compared to former and never. But again, this is these are very specialized cohorts, you know, kind of selecting out for COPD um, patients. So it can be hard to generalize uh, to the general population. Now, whether or not cannabis can induce pulmonary infections, there is some data to suggest that it can alter uh, immune response. It can increase uh, certain cytokines and certain TLR receptors that are critical for uh, defense against bacterial and viral infections. There are these case reports of aspergillus infections uh, affecting um, immunocompromised individuals. I would say that the, the, the population that this has been studied best in are people living with HIV. Um, so this is a study that uh, looked at men who have sex with men. Some of them had HIV, some of them did not. And what they found was that if you smoked cannabis daily or weekly, you had a much higher uh, risk of having a pulmonary infection compared to those who only smoked less than monthly. Um, the risk was particularly great in those who smoked both cannabis and tobacco uh, together. However, just to show you the instability of these results, you can take that exact same cohort, the exact same participants, 
tweak your statistical model, change the entry criteria, and one year later, your friends and colleagues can publish another study completely refuting everything that your graduate student worked on. So this study showed that there was actually no risk uh, for cannabis smoking and, and pulmonary infections, whether they be uh, PJP or non-PJP pneumonias. Now, I will say that the one uh, finding that they were able to replicate was that um, in, if you were HIV negative, there appears to be no risk uh, for a pulmonary infection. So that was consistent um, between the two studies. Now, in terms of lung cancer, there is always this concern because the if you look at the chemical analysis of cannabis smoke, there are carcinogens, right? So in, in fact, there are these you know, carcinog carcinogenic polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that are that can be found actually in higher uh, abundance in cannabis smoke compared to tobacco smoke. So here's the ratio of cannabis to tobacco on the y-axis. On the other hand, though, there appears to be less formaldehyde, less acetaldehyde, less cadmium, less arsenic. So hard to say, um, you know, there's probably some risk and, and, and some benefit in comparison to tobacco smoking. If you take uh, murine epithelial cells and you expose them to cannabis smoke or tobacco smoke, you can actually see a lot of genes are expressed that, are, that, are, that overlap. And a lot of these genes will enrich for xenobiotic metabolism pathways, oxidative stress, DNA damage response, and inflammation. Can you actually see this in the airway? Um, there have been some very old bronchoscopy studies looking at cannabis and tobacco injury. This is, um, this is one from 1998 where they asked the bronchoscopist to grade erythema, edema, and secretions. So a bronchoscopist would say, well, there's no erythema all the way to you know, whatever beefy red means. Um, and they found that those who smoked uh, cannabis, so here as an example, had, you know, a higher uh, index of some of these markers compared to never smokers. This is somewhat subjective. I can imagine that, you know, I might say something is beefy red and Dr. Sin might say something is not. So what if the pathologist looked at it and uh, quantified how much hyperplasia or metaplasia uh, and cell disorganization? This is, this is a busy slide, but, but here, it's kind of complicated because they, they, they threw in cocaine. So here, cocaine, cocaine, cocaine is CS here. MS is, you know, marijuana, tobacco, and then all of the combinations. And so what they found was if you look here under MS, so, uh, in comparison to, uh, non-smokers, you will have more hyperplasia. You will have more cell disorganization, uh, mitotic figures, metaplasia. <laughs> What's interesting though, is if you smoked cocaine with your marijuana, you act, you could actually attenuate some of that signal. So whether or not that was protect, I, I don't recommend smoking uh, cocaine if you're going to smoke it with, uh, uh, with, with cannabis, but it was an interesting finding. But again, this is all kind of muddled because, because of the cocaine here. What does this actually mean in real life? Is there a risk for lung cancer? And you can see here from this slide of all of the studies that have looked at lung cancer, the results are all over the place. So there are some studies that suggest a higher risk and there are some studies that suggest no, no risk at all. This is an attempt at a meta-analysis where the authors note a very high, you know, moderate to high risk of bias in all of these studies. And in the end, these authors kind of threw up their hands. All studies had moderate to high risk of bias and were generally limited by the small number of marijuana only smokers. Most marijuana users also use tobacco. Minimal exposure to marijuana, poorly described use assessment, inadequate adjustment for confounders, study results were mixed, and we were unable to pool data for this outcome. Therefore, we concluded that evidence of the association between marijuana use and incident lung cancer was insufficient. So we really don't have an answer to this question yet. So there are a lot of outstanding questions that we have. Um, and to set up our cohort, we, we kind of framed the problem in this way. Um, we don't know yet whether the increase in the prevalence of cannabis smoking among Canadians resulted in a higher burden of lung disease. What's the impact been on our healthcare system in terms of utilization and cost burdens? Can you detect structural damage now that we have newer imaging modalities? And what changes does cannabis induce in the microenvironment of the airway on a cellular and molecular level? We have much more uh, sophisticated uh, sequencing uh, platforms now so that I don't have to you know, stand with a bronchoscope asking if something is erythematous or not. So 
we have in the background of this a, a country in which the demographics may be changing in terms of who uses cannabis. We have changes in the legalization and its implications for reporting. So I think we were in this space where um, we could pose these questions, utilizing some of the newer technologies to update a lot of, um, a lot of the older studies that I've, I've just shown you. And that, so that takes us to um, our study, the Canuck study. This stands for Canadian Users of Cannabis Smoke. Um, so this was uh, funded by CIHR like just literally days before we all went into lockdown. So we're just about uh, a year uh, into recruitment here. And uh, it has been a, a huge effort to get this up and running during the pandemic. Some of you are in the, in the audience today who have been a part of that. Um, we have three aims to really quantify whether or not there is lung injury in cannabis users. One arm to look at the clinical aspects, um, respiratory symptom burdens, events, healthcare utilization. One arm that looks at the structure and function, not just using our standard diagnostic tools, but also using uh, tools like oscillometry and functional MRI. And finally, the third arm is our bronchoscopy arm, uh, where we've been looking at cellular and molecular responses to cannabis smoking. Um, we have two sites, uh, our site and Western, um, under the leadership of Grace Paraga. And what's nice is that it is a longitudinal study. So we are following these participants for three years. Um, they all undergo questionnaires, PFTs, oscillometry, blood draw. And then we have this optional arm where we can do CT, MRI, and bronchoscopy. We follow them each year um, with repeat spirometry and also every three months, our study coordinators call them to evaluate for exacerbations, you know, any events that might precipitate antibiotics, corticosteroids, increased respiratory symptoms. And then they come back at year three um, uh, to repeat all of these studies at baseline, and in particular CT, MRI, and bronchoscopy. So I'm going to present to you some preliminary results. We have had now over 100 um, patients consented for this uh, uh, for this protocol. And I'll show you the first cut of our data, which was um, done by Cassie Gilchrist, who is a student uh, in my lab. And so our uh, cohort is, uh, as you can imagine, it's young, right? So our cannabis smokers on average are 30 years old. Uh, interestingly, the majority are uh, female, but we do capture also gender identity and other, um, uh, 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 we, we capture employment, uh, finances, uh, sort of socioeconomic status, education. So we have all these variables in our database. Uh, most are white, but there is a range uh, of uh, ethnicities and races. For those who do smoke cannabis, about 25% have actually a pretty considerable history, so over 20 joint years, um, but there is a spread between less than 5 and 5 to 20. And the vast majority will smoke for recreational purposes. Um, it's just a very small minority of um, participants who are only using it for medical reasons. Um, so our Protocol is um, looking specifically at cannabis smoking, but this, this is why it is difficult to study cannabis smoking alone. There is only a handful of individuals in the cohort who only smoke cannabis, and most people have at least two other methods by which they use cannabis. The majority eating, uh, there's water pipes, vaping here. So this, this is where the signal can become a little bit um, difficult to tease out. Um, but this is the way that people are using cannabis here. What's interesting is that um, just over 40% would actually consider their cannabis use out of control. Now, I will admit there's probably a bias here of who's going to sign up for a study. You might be worried about your health, and, and it takes a lot of motivation to sign up for a study. Um, but there is a sizable chunk of our cannabis smoking population who are worried. Um, so this is over 50% who responded um, that they do worry about cannabis use. Um, some often and some always or nearly always. And then there's also um, a sizable population who actually wish they could stop using, but are finding that it is difficult um, to stop using cannabis. And so there's, there's um, a, a small minority will say that it's actually impossible for them to stop using at this point. Perhaps tied in with this is what we found to be associated with cannabis smoking in terms, in terms of their comorbid conditions. So um, here on the left-hand side are our non-smokers. Here in the middle bar are 
cannabis smokers and here are your dual cannabis tobacco smokers. And there does seem to be the signal for depression and anxiety in these groups. Um, again, we don't know whether you know, chicken or egg, whether they're using the cannabis to treat these symptoms or whether the, the cannabis is exacerbating depression and anxiety, but I think this is an interesting signal. We do capture other comorbidities, but none of them have, a, a, have quite the relationship that depression and anxiety do. Now, moving on to some of our respiratory um, uh, parameters here, we are capturing respiratory symptoms and, and the impact that respiratory symptoms have on your life using two tests. The one here on the left is your St. George's Respiratory Questionnaire, and the one here on the right is a COP assessment test. And both of these ask about the symptoms, um, their impact on activity, the impact on the quality of their life. And the way these scales work is anything high on this scale is bad. The higher your score, the worse you are. And I've put dotted lines here where normal, like below the threshold would be considered normal. So you can see here that cannabis smokers actually have a significantly higher uh, respiratory symptom burden and its impact on their life compared to never smokers. The highest will be your dual smokers, but you can see that um, even though these patients are younger, right? So they're only 30 years on average, they're having quite significant symptom burdens. I mean, a score of 60, you know, you'd see this with a very severe COBD patient. So this is quite uh, alarming given how young our patient population is. So where is this injury coming from? You can't actually detect it if you use our conventional diagnostic tool. So there's actually no difference in terms of their FEV1, pre-bronchodilator, post-bronchodilator, no significant difference in their bronchodilator response. So you can't really detect it on spirometry, nor can you detect it on measures of plethysmography. So when we look at total lung capacity or functional residual capacity or residual volume, what we're looking for are, you know, evidence of hyperinflation or air trapping. And we really don't actually see that here. Um, you can see here that there may be a signal for TLC greater than the upper limit of normal, but this is largely driven by a small number in the, in the, in the dual smoking group. So I wouldn't say that that's a signal yet. In general, I would say these are pretty similar across the board. When you look at their DLCO, in fact, their DLCO doesn't appear to be significantly reduced in just the uh, cannabis smoking group. There is a reduction in the cannabis tobacco smoking group, but not in your cannabis only. So I suspect that this is driven largely by tobacco smoking. So again, you're not probably going to see this just using uh, diffusion capacity. What you're also not going to see is any sort of uh, big signal on qualitative CT imaging. So Jonathan Leipzig has been going through all of our CT data, and there's really no signal for emphysema or bronchiectasis, ground glass, um, uh, measures of ILD. So it's not going to necessarily show up there either. What I do think is interesting about our study is our bronchoscopy arm. So we have been um, uh, taking a, a, a small portion of these patients to bronchoscopy where we can uh, collect uh, a lot of airway specimens and study them. And we've been, we've been doing this, uh, you know, in other population groups, COPD, HIV for about 10 years now. So this is, um, this has been a, uh, a longstanding biobank that we've had. I, to be honest, I was worried when we set up this protocol during the pandemic that nobody would want to show up for one of these things. But in fact, it's actually been the opposite. This has been one of the most popular aspects of the study. And in fact, we're so behind, we can't, we can't get enough patients fast enough through this protocol. So, so this has been a really uh, kind of exciting way to look at measures of airway in injury that we might not be able to capture just using our conventional diagnostic tools. This is a pretty involved protocol. So it takes me 45 minutes to bronchi each patient, but we collect oral water washings and bronchoscope channel washings. These are to control for any sort of background contamination in our suite. I collect 12 cytologic brushings and what these will do, will these will collect airway epithelial cells. We do two BALs. I do one on each side. Um, and so we can collect some immune cells like macrophages, lymphocytes, and we collect blood on that same day as well. So it's a whole, uh, a whole morning, um, that, a, that a participant is here. Um, but they actually, they, they love this aspect of it. A lot of them are interested in pictures from their airways and to see, um, uh, what sort of potential damage there has been with longstanding cannabis smoking. Um, but what's neat about this is that we can actually use some newer sequencing platforms to look at airway injury. Um, and so 
I'm going to show you some of the preliminary data that um, Annie Lee and Feruza Garielli have put together. This, this is um, single cell RNA seq from our bronchial brushes, um, which is to say that we are um, doing sequencing on the airway epithelium here. Um, this, we can't do this on everyone. It's very, very expensive. It's about a dollar a cell um, to sequence. And we sequence about, you know, anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 cells per patient. So it's a small select group, but I think it's showing us some interesting things. Um, so when we, when we look at single cell sequencing, we can take the individual gene, uh, gene expression signature and actually start to, um, uh, to, to, uh, annotate which cells these signatures are coming from. So before with bulk RNA-seq, I would have grouped all of these cells together and tried to look for a signal. And some of this actually could have been washed out. You can see here now that we can actually look at the signal for say macrophages versus ciliated cells versus basal cells. And so this is giving us a lot more granularity in terms of what we can learn from the lung. When I overlay the plots of cannabis smokers to non-cannabis smokers here, it actually looks pretty similar, right? So if I actually take the proportions of cells, uh, cannabis here on the left, non-cannabis here on the right, it's actually quite similar. But the actual genes they're expressing are different and they're interesting. If I group these cells um, to their category, so ciliated cells, basal cells, macrophages, T cells, and secretory cells, there are a number of, actually a lot of genes that are differentially expressed when you compare cannabis smoking to non-cannabis smoking. I'm going to focus here on this slide on all of the overlap. So there is this core gene response made up of 12 upregulated genes and 29 downregulated genes that seem to be consistent with cannabis smoking across all of these cell types. If you look at these genes, it's, it's actually interesting which sort of pathways that they enrich. Some of this might actually be protective. So surfactant protein B, SCG, b 3 a 2 these are surfactant genes that may actually be protective towards the lung. On the other hand, you may have genes that are injurious. So, so some of these are cancer. Uh, uh, related genes that um, their, their, their signal, their downregulation here has been associated with increased cancer risk. So it's a little bit of a mixed bag here. When you, when you hone that um, signature down to say basal cells, I think some very interesting genes pop up. So this, these are the, this is the table of uh, genes that are both upregulated and downregulated with cannabis smoking in basal cells. So basal cells are going to be your uh, airway progenitor cells. And what was interesting was how many genes came up that already had known associations with COPD, emphysema, asthma, airway, epithelial repair mechanisms. And so some of these um, are, are well known. Like So periostin is a, is a very uh, well-characterized gene related to type 2 uh, infl inflammation and asthma. It's related to airway epithelial thickness. Uh, it's related to, you know, it's a biomarker potentially used for who might respond to biologics. We have genes um, that are associated. Uh, so this secretory leukocyte uh, protease inhibitor that's highly associated with emphysema production uh, when it's downregulated um, has a lot to do with um, uh, uh, sort of uh, bacterial invasion of epithelial cells. We have some tumor suppressor genes here. We have um, genes like EGR1, which have been associated with allergy responses. Uh, so this, you know, downregulation of this gene is associated with greater potentiation uh, of inflammation with uh, house dust mite. So there's a lot of genes actually here that uh, are suggestive of an airway epithelial injury. It's similar when you look at the ciliated cells. So what will pop up are genes like TFF3. This is actually very important for airway epithelial regeneration. And so deficiencies in this will cause uh, uh, problems with regeneration and wound repair healing um, because it promotes a ciliogenesis and airway epithelial migration. Um, ciliary function is impacted. This is a gene that's actually associated with primary ciliary dyskinesia. Um, uh, you know, mice that are deficient in this immunoglobulin receptor here are known to develop emphysema. So there were actually a lot of genes that were popping up here that would suggest that there are there is actually an airway epithelial repair injury. You can see this as well in some of the secretory cells, like in goblet cells and in club cells here, where you see a lot of pathways having to do with airway epithelial regeneration, susceptibility to infection and innate immunity of the lung. So what I would say from, from this is that I think by saying that for these patients who have pretty significant symptom burdens to 
discount them because they have no changes in their PFT or no changes in their CT is doing them a disservice. And I think there are these airway epithelial repair mechanisms that may be disrupted at the level um, of the single cell that we can see um, that may be associated with their symptoms. Now, what's nice about our protocol is that in three years time, these patients will return for a bronchoscopy. And so we can start to actually see whether these responses are attenuated if you quit smoking or if they continue to build over time. Um, so I think that was, um, uh, that's an interesting finding. We'll, we'll, we'll see in three years what happens. Now, um, in the last bit of the talk, I do want to tell you where we're going, because I think we can look for injury signals using other newer technologies. And so what we have done is we've started to do optical coherence tomography in our bronchoscopy uh, suite. So this is done with the assistance of uh, Tuamus Japanich. So this is uh, this has been used in cardiology and ophthalmology for years now, but it's not really been uh, you know, in, in regular bronchoscopy, except for research purposes. This is a small catheter that we can um, put down the working channel of a bronchoscope and it can reflect light at, uh, at five to 15 microns as opposed to like a thousand microns for a CT. So it gives us really, really high resolution images of the airway epithelium that you can't see uh, otherwise. And so we can integrate this into our bronchoscope. So this is a, a conventional photo uh, of our bronchoscope here, our flex bronch here. And then on this side, we have an actual image of the airway epithelium. And so Carly here is uh, one of our postdoc fellows who's starting to quantitate these. So these are images where you can see here on the left side, a very thickened airway epithelium with a lot of mucus compared to a very healthy uh, 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 airway epithelium here. Um, and so we can start to see uh, airway injury potentially at, at a level of granularity we were never able to capture before. You can actually see here some of the individual layers of the airway wall, which I think will be really, really interesting to quantify. Um, What's nice here is that we can, um, you know, see, we can actually reconstruct the airway when I do, when we do these brushings now. And so this is an example of a pullback where we can actually see the lumen of the airway um, where we actually collect our brushings, which we were never able uh, to do before. So I think this is going to be a really neat tool to start to look for um, uh, other measures of airway injury. Um, other things that we are going to start doing. So Carly is also working with Jordan Gannett and Bill Scheel at UBC to start exercising these patients. And so some of them may not have any signs of injury when you just sit them down and do a PFT, but upon exercise, we may be able to discover some degree of pathology. And so we'll be starting that up soon. Um, and we'll be doing those with, uh, you know, catheters that can measure diaphragmatic effort uh, and amplitude. So that'll be really exciting. Um, Rachel Eddy, uh, who is a postdoc in, in Dawn's lab, is looking at uh, functional MRI. So actually taking hyperpolarized xenon gas MRI and looking at ventilation defects in these patients, which is a much more sensitive measure than perhaps what conventional CT can show us. Uh, and then finally, at the end of uh, all of this, we are working together with Andrea Gershon at uh, the University of Toronto and most in Sadat Safavi at UVC to look at healthcare utilization by linking our cohort with POP Data BC and with ISIS in Ontario. Um, so part of my motivation for presenting this today was that if you do have any interested participants, we would love to see them. These are all the methods in which you can contact me. If you would like to participate, we offer all of the uh, Versed and fentanyl you would need for a bronchoscopy. We pay, okay, so it's $200 of bronchoscopy. <laughs> um, and so if you would like to participate, we would love to have you. We are actually very interested in tobacco only smokers. That is a gap, as you can see from our demographic table. We really would like to have a tobacco only smoking group to compare. So if you have patients who are interested, um, these are the ways to contact us. This is our Instagram handle. We have a study website. Uh, so get in touch. Um, finally, I just want to thank this. Th I mean, this was a Herculean effort to get this off the ground during the pandemic. There are people in the audience, um, uh, Emma, Carissa, Kaylee, Lauren, all of you guys have been uh, incredibly helpful in setting this up and getting all of these patients through um, and certainly to uh, members of our lab and our collaborators. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions. Um, yeah. And any uh, suggestions that you might have.
So Janice, just a question, where did you get the original volunteers and how did you get them? Yes, good question. So uh, we do advertise. Um, so we have advertised on a platform called Reach BC, which um, uh, will give a, you know, will give participants sort of a description of our study. We've had a lot of word of mouth. So friends of friends of friends who have done this have, uh, have uh, come by for this study. To be honest, we have not done a full scale uh, papering of this city. We actually could not handle the, the amount of interest that we had in this study. So um, it's it's been really interesting um, to, to see where they come from. But but th in general, that that are those are the platforms. Maybe Emma, you could, you know, I don't know whether we've had that much traffic from Instagram or Twitter or Facebook. Facebook. Yeah. Facebook has been very successful. Okay. Yeah. How many? How, we we've enrolled over a hundred so far. Yeah, we've completed about 30 Bronx. We've done, what, 70 to 80 CTs, MRI so far. So, yeah. Yeah. Jillian. Oh, yes. Yes, Jill. Dennis, that was an awesome uh, talk. I really actually liked the um, historical context as well. I didn't know some of those uh, details. So thank you for that. Um, two kind of more practical questions. One, um, have a couple patients that I would think about maybe sending uh, to you, but um, one of them has a uh, prior history of asthma. Mm -hmm. Do you enroll patients that have? Yeah, no, no, this, we, we're very, very open about enrollment. We want this to be as population-based as possible. So there's actually very few exclusion, like if you can't read or sign consent, basically you can't participate, but we want this to be any comers. So I do not make a distinction for prior lung disease, we're happy to take whomever. The only portion that I would say where I'm a little bit more strict is who gets to go for bronchoscopy. So I do do a medical review of everybody. If I think you're too sick to undergo bronchoscopy, if I think there's a problem um, that may come up, then I, then I will be more restrictive about who undergoes that portion of it. But in general, for the main protocol, we are happy to take really anybody. Okay. Because we want I'll... we want this to reflect we want this to reflect the population of cannabis users in this province, and I don't want to you know select out people who who have lung disease necessarily. I'll keep that in mind for my uh, two patients that I think would um, be yeah, good absolutely. for the study. Um, and then um, the other question was, you know, just practically when you're seeing patients in your clinic who have a high uh, amount of um, you know can yeah. cannabis smoking, are you recommending, especially if they don't want to, you know, completely quit, um, do you recommend for those patients ever to switch yeah. to edible so, forms? So my spiel, my spiel on this is I say to them that from what we know in the literature, they're likely to have a higher symptom burden, but we don't know about sort of longer term effects on lung function and lung cancer. I'll say that is a blank. I, I kind of let them decide on that. I certainly, if they're dual tobacco or, or cannabis smokers, focus my attentions more on tobacco than I do on their cannabis. And in general, people are much more willing. People understand that they need to give up tobacco. They are not very willing to give up their cannabis, though, actually. So I, I do say that. Um, but I, I, I concede and I have to tell patients that we don't know a lot. And that the and that the literature is often muddled, and that separating signals out from tobacco are very confusing. So I I, I concede that, right? Because um, I think that's the I think that's the truth right now, and we will learn more. And then if they want to learn even more, they can sign up for a study. Thanks, Jeff. Yes. Are you surprised at the injury? Uh, that you're seeing mm. to bronchoscopy? Yeah. Okay. So I'll tell you. I didn't actually mention this, but. So I've done almost all of these bronchoscopies and we're, these are 25 to 30 year olds. I don't, I mean, I've, I've, I've bronched a lot of 70 to 80 year olds who have been smoking tobacco for a long time. And I will tell you that when I do a lavage on these patients, I never see as much carbonaceous material coming back at me as I do in these 25 to 30 year olds. The, the fluid that comes out of their lungs is like gray to black. And that can't, I imagine that can't be good for you at the age of 25 to 30. So, and I don't tend to see, like, I don't see that as much. In, and, and it's probably due to that filtration or, you know, the, the filtration of the, of the, of the, uh, you know, of the cigarette itself. So, so I, I, that part, I think I, I wasn't anticipating there to be that much, but, but this, this is what I've seen in, in their bronchoscopies. Yeah. 
Uh, so when I reviewed the literature, maybe like closer to 10 years ago about the question of does cannabis smoke, uh, is there an association with lung cancer? It seemed that the literature up until about 15 years ago was pretty un uniformly negative or no, no association. But back then, most of those studies, epidemiologic studies, would quantify people quite crudely as yeah. marijuana smoker, yes, versus marijuana smoker, no. Yeah. Whereas the more recent epidemiologic studies that were coming out that were showing uh, an association were ones that tried to quantify the exposure by joint years, et cetera. But obviously, there's no uniform marijuana, let alone uniform uh, decision as to what one joint of marijuana actually mm -hmm. uh, implies. But there was even one epidemiologic study that suggested that one joint year uh, was equivalent to one pack year of cigarette smoking. So I'm just wondering, mm -hmm. have there been even more recent epidemiologic studies that have tried to refine the how to categorize people's marijuana smoking? Hmm. That's a good question. I don't think I have an answer to that, especially in terms of lung cancer, because I haven't seen anything recent uh, compared to that. That 2019 meta-analysis that I showed you was probably the last real attempt to quantify this. But, but the question was, yeah. that, that meta-analysis probably analyzed everything, which includes, be, again, be like if us, if we were doing studies where we're categorizing tobacco smoking as yes versus no yeah. versus it'd be very clear. pack years you're gonna get very different yeah. Uh, information yeah especially since like people smoke cannabis you know, potentially socially right. or you, you know yeah. it's hard to say i mean i think i would wonder whether now that we've started to do lung cancer screening whether this is an opportunity to actually quantify that risk in a much more systematic way um i don't know whether steve is collecting any of those data but i think that would be interesting i don't think that's an Criteria. No, it's not. But so, it, so it, you're going to be muddled. You're going to be muddled with tobacco still. It's driven by cigarettes. Yeah, I don't think we can answer that question either. Our patients are too young, and the and the longitudinal component is too short. So I, lung cancer is a tricky one. It's a very very tricky one. So one final question. I know it's at time, but what, what about the the uh, the doses that people are having? So how do you standardize? What does one marijuana cigarette versus another? Well, the best way that we can do, okay, there's a couple of things here. So we have, we've asked patients for grams. Some will give us that, some will not though. We are also starting to ask for the concentration. So if you buy it from a legal source and not off the street, there will be a concentration of THC on the packet. So we are starting to collect that, although we were late to collecting that. So we'll have to figure out what the data are. I don't have that yet, but we're trying to quantify it that way. But you're right. I mean, what is a joint? It can mean different things to different people if you roll your own. Yeah. But also it may not necessarily be the THC in the marijuana smoke that is potentially causing no, it's the, the combustible problems that we're material looking too, yeah. for, right? Yeah. I mean... For example, other exactly. Yeah, no, no, no. It's, so all, it's, for, it's not going to represent yeah. everything, but it may, and, but it's and, some and, way of quantifying. The and dose. even if you yeah. look at the literature, the studies yeah. of is vaping marijuana smoke safer than smoking marijuana smoke? Most of those studies just look at the the uh, THC content. They don't actually look at carcinogen exposure per se. No, um, but that's that's going to be very. That, very, that, very that's going to require an actual trial, yeah. like an actual like intervention trial. Good. All right. Thanks, guys. No, we have a non smoking. We have a non smoking arm. Yeah. Yeah. We don't judge. Even if you do, even if you do smoke, we don't judge. Good job. Thanks. Thanks, Colin.